Hello, my name is Lydia De Rosa. I was a professional singer for about 30 years and I have taught singing for over 40 years. Today I'm going to talk to you about various techniques of singing. Some people ask, why learn technique? Well, a lot of people do sing really well, just naturally. But we use technique. Technique is so important for days when the voice isn't responding well. If you know technique, then when things are just not going as you would like them to go, then you pull on different aspects of technique to help you make what would be to you a reasonable performance and is extremely acceptable to everybody else. That's why we learn technique. Now, the most important thing I feel for singing is our posture. If we're not standing well, then we can't breathe properly, we can't support properly, and it doesn't really look wonderful for presenting how you're going, your, your piece of music. How we stand, we stand with our feet just about the same distance apart as our shoulders. We keep our shoulders nicely down and relaxed and our bottom just tucked in a little bit underneath us so we'll have our knees nice and soft. And our arms, we can just do for just now, just have them nicely by, relaxed and down by your side. Now, that is basically for standing. If we are sitting, as you will do probably if you're in a choir, we would sit down with one foot ideally in front of us, the back, the other leg slightly behind, and we would sit forward in our chair. That way you can pull up with your back. We want to ideally be pulling up with the back of our, about back of our neck and keeping our eyes just focused forward. That way you can tuck in on your abdominal muscles, you can keep your shoulders down and you can hold the music properly, which comes to the point of holding the music. I have here the book, oops, sorry. When we're holding music, one hand flat on the back of the music, depends whether you're right or left-handed, which one you choose. And that leaves the other hand free to turn the pages as you require. The music you should have held about that level, that distance, so that the conductor can see you, an audience if you're standing, can see your face. There's nothing worse than working with singers whose music is covering their face all the time. It's a barrier for the sound coming out and it's a barrier for anybody being able to see your face. Now, our back when singing, whether we be standing or sitting, we want to be able to have a lot of expansion on our back. Our rib cage is very, very wide across the back and we need that to be able to move. We want our rib cage lifted up from the hips. Up, yes, like so. Knees softly bent and you can feel, you can expand the rib cage round the back when you breathe in. Now you're not going to get that in a matter of hours or days. That takes time to build up, to breathe, to expand the back. Yes, you could try that. I often say to my pupils, stand against a door or a wall. Pull yourself tall, put your shoulders against the wall. Tilt your pelvis forward slightly so your knees are slightly bent. And that way you can feel how we are tucked in here. Now this is where we support from. Many people seem to think that this is where we support from. 
our rib cage needs to be able to be free to move in and out like a pair of bellows or like an accordion. This is our diaphragm here. It needs to be able to move. Our support is here our lower abdominal muscles. You'll feel it right up either side of the pelvis. Some men and some women actually use their buttocks to support as well. They tuck in on their buttocks. So you could try that, go over to a door and see how it works for you. Our shoulders at all times, as I said, must be down. When we take a breath, we don't want to take a breath, whether it be mouth or nose. We don't want to, and the shoulders come up. That is breathing too high. It's what's called clavicular breathing. We do not want to do that. The shoulders, sometimes think of something positive as opposed to think, I mustn't take up my shoulders when I breathe. Instead think, stretch the shoulders to the side. Keep the shoulders down and you'll feel it here. Now, in the past, people used to sing with their hands locked, fingers locked together. This is how I was initially taught. And people sang holding their hands like that. That's a bit outdated now. People tend to stand with their hands by their side. You can stand with your hands much more relaxed there. Or you could stand with a hand on the piano or on the music stand. You could put a hand there. That can have benefits too because it can help you just to push up a little bit. If you're actually holding your hands together like that, that can be quite beneficial at times because it can help initially just to keep your rib cage up and lifted. Footwear. On our feet, we need something comfortable. If you're used to wearing high heels, that's probably fine. But the only thing about very high heels or high heels is that as you tilt yourself forward like that to get the proper balance, you will land up with a bit of a duck spawn at the back. <laughs> and if you do that, then you're not going to be able to get the expansion around the rib cage at the back. So ideally comfortable shoes. In the past, we had to stand with one foot at the front and one foot at the back, balancing on one of these feet. Now, that can be quite challenging. Breathing. We want, I, I teach people to breathe through the nose initially and during a piece of music, when there's no time to do that, breathe through the mouth. The reason I believe in breathing through the nose at the start, it warms the breath to the throat and the throat likes warm breath. It also lifts you up and over the note and it has a calming effect, breathing through the nose. But during a piece of music, if you have to breathe and there is not sufficient time to breathe through the nose, because it is a slow, uh, it's a slower way of breathing and it can be quite noisy. You wouldn't want to go in the middle of a piece of music. You would have to breathe very quickly, very deeply as a swimmer would, as they put their head under the water to get a breath before coming up again. So. Running out of breath, oh dear, everybody has experienced that. And it can be quite a worry. It can make people quite tense if they see a big phrase ahead of them and they think, I'm not going to get to the end of this. It does take time. You need to take the phrase out and you need to practice it and practice it until you can sing it quite easily. But a lot of the time when a person runs out of breath for singing, it's because they have overbreathed at the start. They've taken a huge breath and what happens is it just explodes out immediately you start singing. So we have to be very careful not to overbreathe. Now I did mention about support. 
Support is here. So once we have breathed, we, for stand, we stand up nice and tall, keep our shoulders down, keep our rib cage lifted. So we're almost separating the body into two halves. Now, many people believe their support is here, but that has got to be free for breathing. The support, as I said, is here. So we want to be tucked in. We want to tuck in that breath, tuck in that support, sorry. When we go up to high notes, we need to, a lot of singing is sometimes contrary. So as we go up to high notes, you can almost feel you're pushing down. You could think you're pushing yourself out of a swimming pool and you can feel the pool there. As we go down to low notes, we want to widen out and think up, think higher, but all the time keeping wide so you can open up the pit for the voice to go down. Now we come to vowels. The vowels are what carry the sound, the line of music. And consonants, immediately put the consonant in, that cuts the sound of music, the, 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 the line of music. So we have to try and lengthen the vowels as much as possible within a word. We have different types of vowels. We have dark vowels and we have bright vowels. The dark vowels, o, 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 ours a bit in the middle, I'll explain to that in a minute. And then we have bright vowels, e, a. These are bright vowels, e bright vowels. Now, if we were to sing an oo vowel, or put your mouth in the shape for an oo vowel, oo, oo, we have the mouth in the correct shape for singing. You'll feel the roof of your mouth going up, rising up, the jaw coming down, oo, oo, and the tongue, hopefully, has fallen forward behind the bottom teeth. Ooh. So we can say oo, o, o. Now, singing is an extension of speech. So a huge amount of this you can practice speaking first of all. Now we come to e, a, e. And you will notice when you say e, a, e, that the roof of your mouth has come, and come down. It's fallen. E, A, E. As opposed to when you sang O, 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 and it was up in a beautiful dome. In a beautiful dome. O, O, O. Now, what we want to do is try and have those vowels meeting in the middle so that you have one consistent quality of sound. So you could say o e and try and keep the roof of your mouth up a bit now r r can be dark it can be bright depending upon your dialect so we could say a dark r and in which case you will want to try and get that more consistent with the other vowels so you would practice that um R E R E R E R E R E R E R E R E R E R E and get faster and faster. And you can practice that. Now, if you have a very bright ah, then you would practice that, alternate that rapidly with perhaps an aw. Ow, 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 ow. Get faster and faster at it. And that way you can manage to get your vowels much more uniform. Oo is also your softest vowel for singing. So it's an excellent vowel to use if you're learning music, if you're trying to learn the music. It, you could sing for a lot longer on an oo. Now the consonants, they separate the vowels. You don't want to 
hit them terribly hard though. We want to more or less use them as the Italians do, very, very delicately. Because otherwise it sounds like you're munching the consonants around the mouth. When we sing, we have to try to get into the vowel sound right away. Again, if you hit the consonant too hard, you will explode breath, which is not ideal either. Diphthongs. Now, that's when we come to E, A, O, what vowel do we sing on? We sing on the first part of the vowel and just put the second vowel in right at the end. So we would have owl, the word owl, owl, and then we would have the word say, say, and the E just comes right at the end. Because otherwise you are going to be singing um, say, and that really does not sound very good at all, or ow, and you're closing the sound. So it would be an ow. Yes? Anytime you're learning a piece of music, learn it to the vowel first, and then you will manage to get a consistent sound all the way through. Sometimes when we go on and we learn to words right from the start, what happens is we have problems every so often. And it is often, it's the vowel sound that's causing the problem. So learn first of all to an oo, then try to an ah or an e, and then try to alternate the vowels. And once you can have the piece of music going very nicely with, with all the vowels, then you're in with a very good chance of being able to sing that piece of music quite well. Registers. Everybody's voice has three registers, head, middle, chest. Now, what we have to do is we have to try and camouflage these registers, the, the, the joining of the registers, right? The high, the high, uh, the head registers for the high notes, middle and then chest, obviously. So we have between these registers, we have a little group of notes, usually, which are nicknamed the break. The break being caused by, if you try to sing from the bottom of the scale up, you'll find there comes, there'll become a few notes that really don't sound very good. And that is because you have, have got to be lifting, blend those registers. You've got to be thinking more into the register above. And then we go into the head re register from the middle to the head. The same happens again. We land up with these few notes that either crack or really don't sound very good. So again, that has to be blended. The best way to start that is take your scales coming down the way. Take them coming down the way and you'll manage to blend that better. It's easier to fall into the next, I shouldn't use that word fall, but it's easier to sing the next um, set in the next register if you're coming from above than it is to go up the way. Never sing louder than lovely. That's the title of a book by Isabel Bailey. And it's probably the most important thing I ever learned. Never sing louder than lovely. Some people naturally have very strong voices. Other people have beautiful smaller voices. What we have to learn to do is to work with the voice we've got. If you push your voice to be stronger than it is, or sing right at the extreme of your voice all the time, very louder, very loudly, you will create a very unpleasant sound and also you will gain a wobble. And wobbles are not acceptable. Wobbles can be caused by other things as well, of course. Wobbles can be caused by lack of support. 
um, who's singing too loudly and you're not supporting and then you will get a wobble too. So we never want to sing louder than lovely. Nasal resonance. Now we want resonance on the voice. Resonance is a wonderful thing. You know how sometimes you listen to these actors and their voices almost sound like they're rumbling through the pipes. And some singers' voices, they have such a wonderful resonance on them. So we want resonance. Nasal resonance is a good thing. Is a, is a very good thing. You can practice that by ngs and ngs. It, it's, it's a resonance. You can feel it. Certain sounds and you get this wonderful resonance. It comes on your it um, comes along, can come along your cheekbones, you can feel it in your nose, on your lips, in your ears. Um, that's a wonderful thing. Nasal quality is not. There's the distinct difference. Nasal quality. And then we sang like that, singing through the nose. That's when we're pinching on the nose here to control, to control the voice, to maybe to control the run, control some aspect of the, that you're singing. So we never want to pinch on the nose to create nasal quality. Now, our face. Our face, like our body, has all different sections to it and has all different resonating cavities in it. We have a lovely big resonating cavity here. We have a lovely big resonating cavity here. And a lovely dropped jaw here. So we have three parts. We have the forehead, we have the cheek, cheeks, and we have the, the jaw coming down, nice and slack. At all times, we want to work with the sing, when we're singing, keep the eyebrows up. If your eyebrows are down and you start to frown, you will drag the voice down. You will drag the sound of the voice down and you don't want that. The cheekbones, the cheeks, you want them to have width across them, plenty width. And by raising the eyebrows, that will, you, you will help to enable the cheekbones to stay up. And these are two big resonating cavities, so we want to have them opened up. The jaw, we want the jaw to be nice and slack at all times. If your jaw is tight, it has a knock-on effect. It will make the sound tight. So always keep the jaw nice and slack. It will create a lovely rounded sound and enable you to move very smoothly from one sound to another. The roof of the mouth, as we had discussed before, we want the roof of the mouth up in a lovely dome shape. You could think of the dome of St Paul's Cathedral, something, anything that makes you think of a lovely dome up in the roof of your mouth. You can toy around with that yourself and do that. Now, you could do it to, as we discussed earlier on, ooh, oh, oh. The roof of your mouth naturally goes up there, creating that lovely, surrounded sound. So that's lovely. Now, the other thing that can help you to feel the back of the throat, get your jaw down, get the roof, yawn. Take your jaw down, it will raise the roof of your mouth and it will open up the back of your throat. The other thing that opens up the back of your throat is having the cheekbones wide. So, we're thinking of the face as almost like a heart shape, wide across the cheekbones and down into the jaw. You can think of a heart shape. The tongue. Your tongue, when you sing, wants to be flat. Flat and relaxed. 
you if you could think of your tongue perhaps as it's fainted or how I got it initially was to think of a, a cracking an egg into a pan and the yolk bursts and it splatters all round and I just thought of my tongue as splattered all round the, in, the insides of my bottom teeth and the tip of it wants to be just hitting the back of the front teeth, the bottom front teeth. Now, your tongue wants to be there all the time. If your tongue comes up, it will block your throat. This tends to happen more when people sing their higher notes. It's a kind of tension, nervousness, anxiety, whatever. <gasps> and back the tongue goes. And therefore people don't produce a very good high note because the tongue is blocking the throat. So try to work with your tongue forward. You don't want the tongue to be stiff because if the tongue becomes stiff, the jaw will be stiff. But initially, you might just have to train it to be forward a little bit and be firm and then ease back on that. Then we come to the lips. We always want our lips forward. That projects the sounds, keeps everything going forward. Never, ever take the bottom lip and pull it over your teeth or pull it back. That will send the sound shooting right down your throat. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. You can actually do that slightly with the top lip. You can tuck it under or pull it right down and almost hinge it onto the top teeth. And what that does if you try it just now, explore with your tongue, that lifts the roof of your mouth up. So that can actually be quite handy from time to time to do that. But never, never take the bottom lips over your teeth. Now when you're practicing, you don't want to practice initially, particularly, for long periods of time. You need to focus. And after a certain length of time, the mind switches off. Therefore, you will be practicing, not thinking what you're doing, and you will tire the voice. So initially, just practice for about 10, 15 minutes, building it up. Obviously, once you're singing, you know, I've been singing for years, you'll be able to sing for much longer than that. But at the start, you must keep your practice times to short spells. Otherwise, you will really, really exhaust the voice. Sometimes people get very, very tense when they're singing because they're wanting to do well. So a good way to guard against that is to walk and conduct as you sing. Take your hands like this and just walk as we're, so I'm trying to keep in view of the camera here, and just walk and sing at the same time. You don't want your hands down here, that's doing no good at all, that's just dragging the body down, whereas we want the hands here, like so. Yeah, and just conduct and walk and sing and that that's quite good it gives you it, it keeps you loose it keeps you free and we, we want to be free when we sing now listening to ourselves sometimes people will maybe say to you that's out of tune or that's not a very nice sound and you think oh, I didn't hear that because it's much more difficult for singers to hear ourselves than it is for instrumentalists. Their instruments are being played outside the body. Therefore, they can hear what's coming in. Our instruments 
are inside us. And we've almost got to hear what's going to come out before it does come out. We've got to actually be quite sure of the sound that's going to come out. Now, a good way to do that is to take your hands, these fingertips, put them onto your cheekbones, the thumbs, latch them under the top part of your jaw there, the jawbone, right? And just cup the hand round, move it back a little bit, the fingers back a little bit. And then start, you could even do it by speaking. Focus in and listen to yourself. And you should be able to hear yourself. You'll get the vibrations coming along the cheekbones. So that's quite a good way to hear yourself. The other thing that's, that is good to do when you're practicing is to record yourself and then listen to yourself back because a lot of the time we don't know what we're sounding like. And it can be quite enlightening just to hear that voice coming back and think, goodness, I didn't know I did that. Oh dear, listen to this, that or the next thing. But don't let it put you off singing. Instead, just think, well, I can, I, I can only get better. I will do this and I will work at it. And you will get it. You just have to work at it. And sometimes, particularly in vowel sounds, perhaps the R vowel in particular, what sounds to us like an R, doesn't sound like an R to others. So you could practice singing an R and just think, does that sound like an R? Or would I have to change that a little bit more onto an A or a little bit more onto the O? So that's quite a good thing to do, to listen to yourself all the time. Now we come to soft singing. When we sing softly, it's no different from singing loudly or moderately. We have to sing softly, but we still have to project that voice right to the back of the hall. People have got to hear what you're singing. It requires tremendous support and you've got to think, sing softly. You have to almost use a stage whisper. You have to crispen up your consonants, your diction and really think to the back of the hall. There are other, many other things involved, but you mustn't, what they call, do fall off the line of voice. We have a lovely line that is going onward somewhere and then you're required to sing softly. Or you mustn't just suddenly let it sag, let it sink. You've got to keep on that line of voice. Make the inside of your mouth huge and think softly. It's one of the hardest things to do, to sing softly and to be able to project. Often when we're singing, we think contrary. When we're singing high, we think low. And when we're singing, singing low, we think high. You must always, I use the word um, ground control to major tom. You're singing high, push down. Keep, keep grounded, keep very, very grounded. So as you're singing high, you could almost take your hands as you're going up a scale and you could pull them down the way like that with the palms flat. Try doing that. And you'll feel the pull here. And vice versa. When you're singing low, let the voice go down and lift your hands up. And think of opening up a huge pit, but allowing the voice to go down into that huge pit. Each and every one of us has a voice individual to us. We're all different. Never try to sing like somebody else. Let yourself develop your own voice the voice that belongs to you. That way, your voice 
will always sound at its base. If you try to copy another singer, then you're not using the voice that's true to you. Some people have big voices, some people have smaller voices. Always choose your music, be wise. Choose the music that suits your voice. Don't just sing something where you can, obviously in the bathroom or whatever, but if you're doing an audition or singing somewhere, don't just sing something because you like it. Knowing full well, it's sung, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got a small voice, it's sung by some huge Wagnerian soprano. That's not very wise because you won't carry it off very well. Whereas people would love to hear you sing something that really suits your voice. All voices can sing different styles, but we can't, we can't sing all styles. Your voice might suit um, opera, leader, oratorio, but really not work when it comes to um, musicals, light music at all. Therefore, stick with what you're good at. Because unfortunately, people can be very cruel at times. So know which areas and that you can sing in well and keep to that. Similarly, if you're choosing a piece of music for an audition, choose wisely. Rather choose a piece that has moderate difficulty and sing it really well than trying to choose a piece of music that is quite complex and maybe you don't sing as well because you that you will impress your listeners far more by the simpler piece singing the simpler piece than by singing that difficult piece that exposes some of your weaknesses we never want to do that now we come to using a music stand. When to use a music stand? Well, if you're doing a certain recital work, people do tend to use music stands a lot of the time. You must watch though, that you do not have that music stand up blocking your face. If you want to use a music stand, put it to the side and put it down so that people can see your face. Because when you're singing, it's your facial expressions the audience are watching. You are telling a story and they need to see you. They don't want to see the back of a music stand. Sometimes a music stand can be very handy though, as I think I mentioned earlier, just to put your hand on. It can, if you're feeling a little bit nervous, can put a hand on the music stand, it can settle you down. Similarly, you could use your hand on a piano and that can just give you that little bit of confidence, just a bit of security there. Now, Qatar, ooh. Yes, so many singers suffer with Qatar, particularly on the west coast of Scotland. Now, many, many singers clear their throats that is the worst thing you can do and any speech therapist would tell you likewise. Don't clear your throat. You are roughening up your throat and you will cause damage. So don't clear your throat. We, we would have to, first of all, try and find out, is there something that's causing the Qatar? Often dairy, produce, yogurts, things like that can cause a lot of Qatar in people's, in people, and they've, they've got to be very careful and either lim limit the amount they eat or cut it out completely, depending on the amount of singing that you're doing. Certain things can help to settle it though. I used to take a big spoon full of honey before I sang, and it just seemed to settle everything down. The other people swear by hot diluted orange juice or lemon barley water diluted in hot or warm water. 
Warm water is always better for you to have rather than having a cold drink when you're singing. As we discussed earlier, when you're taking a breath and you're breathing through the nose, you're warming the air to the throat. Similarly, warm water is kinder to the throat than cold water. So these are things you can think about. What you have to do with the guitar is swallow it down. Now, there will come a, a level and the voice will probably go crack and make some dreadful noises as it's going through the chords. But then you should be clear of it if you can manage to cope with that. It is hard, it's very hard, and guitar is such a nuisance. Throat sweets and throat sprays. Throat sweets, fine. Eat them if you, if you like them and it's up to you. Throat sprays. Be very guarded using throat sprays. Some of these throat sprays, well, I, I suppose probably possibly them all, they kind of numb your throat. So you have to beware not to numb the throat and think, I'm fine, I can sing. Because what might, would, might have been a sore throat that would have maybe lasted five days and after a few days um, after that, you would be all right to sing again. If you've been singing on a throat that needed rest, then that will take weeks to heal up. So do not sing on a sore throat. Don't, if you can put your spray down if you want, but don't sing. But don't, you must be careful with a sore throat. Never sing on a sore throat. Now we come to talking. When we're talking, if, you've had, if you have a job that requires you to be on the telephone a lot or you're talking to the public, you have to support the voice every bit as much as if you're singing. You need to tuck in here. A lot of people land up with vocal problems because they are using the voice on telephones or just in general, chit chat even completely unsupported, lounging on a settee, sitting on the phone at work like this. There's no support going on. We must always support the voice. That, that is essential, whether you are talking or whether you are singing. When it comes to having a head cold, sneezing, just sneezing and you know it's a bit streamy yes you can sing on that and you can probably sing quite well the problem is you can't hear yourself so when people try to do that they then try to sing louder and louder and louder don't ever do that if you must sing with a head cold just keep your voice it, 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 you won't hear it because all the all your nasal passages will all be bunged up. You won't hear it properly, but just sing as you would normally. Do not try to push the voice louder. It doesn't need to go louder. We can hear you perfectly well. You just can't hear yourself. Before singing, this sounds common sense, do not rush around. You will be all agitated. You will breathe higher and you will be anything but calm for our performance. So do not rush around. There are days when we want to sing, when we want to practice, and we just feel drained, we're exhausted. The mind is willing, but the body is not able. Sometimes you can sing for a little while, and it lifts you out, it energises you to sing. But there are other days when that doesn't happen. Try for five minutes. If you don't become energised, then stop and just say, we'll try again tomorrow. But if you're exhausted, do not try and push yourself. You won't benefit from it, you won't learn anything from it. 
some people even depress themselves because they, they make such awful noises. Well, in their head, they're making awful noises, just a very tired voice. You can't support properly, you can't breathe properly if you're exhausted. So make sure you are not exhausted when you're singing. Eating before singing? Well, some people I know love a huge big meal, hefty meal before singing, but I think in general people don't. It gives you wonderful indigestion and you can't breathe. You can neither breathe nor support properly if you've got a huge amount of food in your stomach. So just have something light a couple of hours before singing. The length of time to sing. Now, when you first start singing, you must take it just in short bursts. Just say 10, 15 minutes and get used to that. You can focus for 10, 15 minutes and you can think what you're doing. The voice, if you haven't been singing before, is not accustomed to it. So like everything else, we have to just build up into it. Over time, that time of practice, will let will stretch and stretch and stretch and you'll be able to sing for much longer periods of time. Always warm up before you sing. If you go singing a song, you must always warm up. Your performance is only as good as your warm up. Always remember that. Make sure the voice is well warmed up before you sing. The effects of sun and the alcohol on the voice. They both have the same effect. They dehydrate. If you were to sunbathe for a while and then try to sing, you'd feel almost as if the voice was crusted. Similarly, alcohol has the same effect. If you were to drink the night before, have quite a lot to drink one night and then try to sing the next day, you would be very aware of it on the throat. That's why they say, don't drink before when you're singing. I know some people tend to gargle port. Well, whether they drink it or not, I don't know, but um, it's, it's best not to, not to drink, al drink alcohol. Unnecessary movements when you're singing. When you're singing in front of somebody, don't start to do all movements that mean nothing. If you make a movement, you want it to mean something. But otherwise, it is extremely distracting. You don't want to stand rigid. You want to stand easy. And just look relaxed and it puts your audience at their ease as well, if you can do that. Nerves. Well, we all get nerves. We all get nervous. Nerves can enhance a performance up to a certain point. But once it gets to the top there, you go down the slippery slope. I believe it's called the Yerksey Dodson theory. You, could, you would come down that slippery slope and those nerves would not enhance your performance. It's where everything just goes out of control. I think one of the most important things to guard against nerves is to make sure that you know your music inside out. Know your music well. Be confident. Learn it way in advance. Don't leave it to the week, the fortnight before to learn the music for a performance. Make sure you know it. And that way, you do take the edge off nerves. The other thing is to think about what you're singing, to try to put across the message of the song to your audience. Take your, taking you away from yourself and how you're feeling, but instead conveying the composer's message. Now, I hope all these tips have been of some use to you. And as I say, do have lessons, but singing to learn online is doable 
as a one-to-one. -one. Ideally, a teacher would want to meet you first and see you. Um, but obviously, we're, this, the climate we're in just now, that's not very possible. But people do need one-to-one -one lessons because we all have very different needs. And a teacher would want to ensure that they were seeing that each person was singing correctly and doing the right thing. So I hope you've enjoyed this talk and got something out of it. Thank you.